Good evening, and welcome to the sixth Cassidy LePage Distinguished Lecture. The annual Cassidy LePage Distinguished Lecture is organized by the Jamaican Language Unit, which is a unit in the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. The lecture is roughly 14 years old, although we have had only five lectures so far. To honor the work and memory of linguists Frederick Cassidy and Robert LePage, the stage has been graced by distinguished international scholars such as Professor John R. Rickford of Stanford University, Professor Carolyn Cooper of Uimona, Professor John McWhorter of Columbia University, and most recently, Professor Emerita Hazel Simmons McDonald, former Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of UE's Open Campus. This evening, we add another to that distinguished lineup. So let's get the show on the road. I now invite Dr. Ingrid McLaren to deliver the formal welcome. Dr. McLaren's main area of teaching and research is academic literacies. She's currently in her fourth year as head of the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy. Dr. McLaren. I believe you're still mute. You're still muted. Ah. All right. Do I need to, do I need to do anything else, um, Dr. Farkasson? No, no, just just go ahead. All right. Let me begin again. Good afternoon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to welcome you all, and more specifically, our guest lecturer. Dr. Carla Washington, to this evening's sixth Cassidy LePage Distinguished Lecture entitled, This and That About Jamaican Children's Speech and Language, Distinguishing, Difference, and Disorder. The Creole um, experts, how did I do with that? Um, okay, we can Dr. work Washington. on it later. <laughs> yes, all right, thanks. Dr. Washington, who is currently associate professor in the Department of Communication, Sciences and Disorders at the University of Cincinnati is no stranger to Jamaica as she has undertaken research on the speech of Jamaican children with focus on bilingualism. Indeed, featured on her list of many, many outstanding presentations and publications are articles relating to her research in Jamaica, which include Intelligibility in control on context scale, sensitivity and specificity, um, excuse the pronunciation, specificity in the Jamaican context. And another translation to practice typical by dialectal speech acquisition in Jamaica. She has also been consultants and a dear um, friend to the linguistic section for over quite a period of time. We're particularly appreciative that Dr. Washington has agreed to present this lecture at a time such as this, when so many activities have, have drawn to a halt. We therefore look forward to her, to what I'm sure will be an informative and stimulating presentation. One moreover that bears such relevance to our content. Thank you so much again, Dr. Washington, for agreeing to share with us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance. So thanks, Dr. McLaren, for starting us off on the right foot. This event falls in line with the strategic objectives of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. It furthers the faculty's goal of encouraging the international exchange of ideas and disseminating those ideas to both the scholarly community and the public. On this basis, the Dean will greet us on behalf of the faculty. The Dean, Professor Waibinti Waiboko, is Professor of African Social History. Please, sir. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Joseph Ferguson, uh, Deputy Dean for Graduate um, Studies and Research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education. 
Um, I'd like to take this opportunity first and foremost to congratulate you and um, our colleagues, both in the JLU and in the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy to have kept um, this particular lecture going from time to time in honor and memory of Cassidy. Um, our expectation is that you will continue to do what you're doing, which will not only um, memorialize the individual, but also contribute to scholarship in the various ways that it has been doing. Um, I particularly, therefore, also like to welcome Dr. Carla Washington. Uh, Carla, by the way, uh, are you, you are a Jamaican? From what Ingrid said, I, I, I suspect you are, right? Okay, so let me therefore say welcome home. Although um, this, is happen this is happening um, online, I could still say to you, welcome back home. We, we welcome you with our arms as open as you can imagine. And, I, and as, as soon as I saw the excitement, I mean, I knew that there must be something just beyond uh, being invited to deliver the lecture. You, you must feel as excited as we all are associating uh, with uh, 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 your brethren and sistren. So, so welcome. Um, just a couple of things. Um, as a historian, I like to say, uh, in relation to uh, in relation to this exercise, um, generally, in all studies in the humanities and social sciences, in anthropology, uh, language is um, validly regarded as the highest manifestation of our people's culture. You, you, you destroy a language and you destroy the most critical part of a people's identity, their personhood, their sense of individual and group identity. In post-colonial societies, in all post-colonial societies, including uh, Jamaica that we are in, the invader, the colonial invader imposed the language of the invader as a language for commerce, as a language for learning, and as a language for bureaucracy. Ultimately, that began to determine for most persons their sense of status in society. You speak as it is determined the invaders language and individuals around you got a sense of what your status is in society. And so the issue of identity is implicated in the process of not only destroying the indigenous language, but of acquiring the language that has been imposed. One clear implication of imposing the language of the invader was the underdevelopment of the indigenous language. Consequently, in many post-colonial societies, such as the society we are in, universities have made efforts to undertake an academic study of the indigenous language with a view to reviving it, and by reviving it, restore that sense of self. This particular lecture, Dr. Washington, you're about to deliver, is taking place against the backdrop of a very important development in the University of the West Indies, which is also in sync with an aspect of our AAA strategic plan, which, which emphasizes scholastic activism. The vice chancellor and the university as, as a whole, just a couple of days ago, about three or four days ago, approved a language policy. According to that language policy, a recognition is given to Jamaican and other Caribbean indigenous languages in no less a way, a manner than the English language uh, but, uh, through which I am communicating. 
this is not just symbolic, but it's a recognition of the fact that we are interested in recovering whatever we might have lost by way of the um, identity, the self-identity and identity construction that the imposition of English language on um, the people had created. And herein also lies the value of the JLU. What does it do? It is doing what precisely within the framework of what I'm talking about, Dr. Washington, you are about to do today. This is what makes the title you have chosen even more important. And everybody immediately uh, listening to you and trying to contextualize what you're about to say, even if I haven't heard anything from you, can begin to anticipate what you're about to say. This and that about Jamaican children's speech and language, distinguishing differences and disorder. What created these differences? What created this disorder? Who created the disorder? How was it that it became just this and that? An attempt at re rejecting or denying the pride of place of these languages imposed by the, 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 the colonial masters. So it's, it is in this sense that some of us will listen to the, to, to, to the lecture that you're about to give. It is in this sense that some of us fully appreciate the role of the JLU within the University of the West Indies and certainly within the Faculty of Humanities and Education. So let me, without any preview of your lecture, whilst I'm fully appreciating it, hold back whatever comments that I might have um, for the evening um, until your lecture is delivered, but to extend to you our goodwill and our welcome and to wish for everybody online listening to you a very pleasant lecture that will be informative and quite, and, 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 and quite interesting. Um, thank you, Joseph, for all the work you're doing. And congratulations to the staff of the JLU for all the work that you've been doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dean, for those words of welcome and reminding us about the importance and the primacy of language. And with that, of course, the importance of linguistics. So you mentioned in your greetings, Dean, the Jamaican Language Unit. Um, and that's the entity that is responsible for this event. The Jamaican Language Unit was set up as a language planning agency in 2002, at the request of the Joint Select Committee of the Parliament of Jamaica, um, while they were discussing the draft Charter of Rights. And that is because uh, a representation was made to that committee from the university um, to include um, freedom from discrimination on the grounds of language as one of the fundamental rights of Jamaican. And that charge was led by Professor Hubert Devonish, now Professor Emeritus Hubert Devonish. So the Joint Select Committee asked for the unit to be set up. It was set up and since then has been engaged in researching the language. It has been engaged in teaching, for example, teaching the writing system and of course, general public advocacy. There was a sort of culmination last year while we joined the celebration of the centenary of the birth of the Honorable Louise Bennett Coverley, where we launched a petition to make the Jamaican language official alongside English. That petition was instrumental in uh, um, bringing more public awareness to the language issues and also in drumming up public support for the officialization. The Jamaican Language Unit also runs, um, and, and some people might find this quite interesting, that we run um, an Emmy, a Masters of Arts in the English language, and that has received quite good reviews um, over the years. 
So the MA in the English language is uh, available for those persons who would like to deepen their understanding of the English language, especially if they intend to teach the language in our schools or teach a language as, um, as a second language to non-native speakers, or also if they plan to be um, professional and technical writers of the English language. You can get more information on our ME by contacting the Jamaican Language Unit. So now we are going to break up the monotony of all of the talking we have been doing so far. And we are going to have a little entertainment. The entertainment today is at the, um, it was provided by Tribe Sankofa. It's a pre-recorded um, presentation and this is in keeping with the times that we're living in. Tribe Sankofa is a performing arts collective brought together by Fabian Thomas, a vibrant and eclectic cadre of multi-talented performers who com combine their artistry to add an exciting new dimension to the performing arts landscape of Jamaica and the rest of the world. The niche of uh, San Tribe Sankofa um, is borrowed and original spoken word, poetry, soulful song styling, uniquely blended with other visual and performing arts. Tribe Sankofa has shared their unique offerings in diverse spaces, including being featured at the Poetry Society of Jamaica, Bookophilia, Lignum Vitae Awards, Gungawa Alternative Music and Arts Festival, Arts in the Park, and the Investiture of the Poet Laureate of Jamaica, just to name a few. In addition to multiple medals and awards at Talawa Dramatic Arts Festival and the Jamaica Cultural Development Speech and Drama Competitions, the collective has also staged its own productions, Black Bodies, A Tribe Thing, and their signature annual production, Word Soul. Tribe Sankofa was a featured performer at the Kaifesta Symposium 2017 in Barbados. Rising above the challenges and restrictions of COVID-19, the collective presented their first virtual season in August 2020. And now we will get an indication of the talent of Tribe Sankofa. Do enjoy. They wanted her piecemealed, paper mache, practically broken, limp like and loveless, a litany of exaggeration. They wanted her low and high, flat and wide, filled with all their empty. They wanted her to be more like them. 
not knowing her conception was immaculate, that she was birthed in sandalwood scented river water, sweet sapphire, honey touched tongue. Oh, she was too much of a mouthful for the greedy. Just a small amount of her was more than they could stand. Oh, they wanted her bland and barren unspirited, un-African, uncultured, under siege in the streets. They wanted her face down, ass up, hands cuffed and ankles strapped. They wanted her knowing she could never want them back. Oh, they wanted her holy, baptized in her divine. They wanted her secrets, pearls to swine. They wanted to unravel the mystery of her design, hypnotized by glory, fascinated by her kind. They wanted her knowing complete. Oh, they wanted her whole though they came fractioned, half-hearted, half-soul, with no regards as to who she really was. Oh, who can understand her? This winding Niger river of a woman, one who is unafraid to tear away, only to roam and then become the wind. She who speaks in gusts and blasts, blasting us back to high ground, higher consciousness. She turns, and so does the world. Hear her speaking, sparking alarm. Oh, dearly beloveds. So dearly departed from the ways of the garden. Beware. For wild women are not to be tamed, only admired. So let her in and witness her. Set your days ablaze. Them saying born with a call, a not quite opaque white veil through which he visioned only many. At birth, them supposed to bury it under some special tree. If we had known, we could have told them it was to be the angel trumpet tree. Ta ta da ta da ta da da da. Far far east past Barica, down by Bournemouth by the sea. The angel trumpet bell both sides and notes like petals rise covering all away. Not enough notes to go about the call that descend regularly and cover this world vision hiding him from me. Find a woman with hair like rivers, a waist unhinged and free, emptied some of the sorrow from the horn's cup into the well below our belly. She promised to take the call from his eyes, to remove the cold matter that clouded his eyes and stand between him and the trumpet tree lobby. The promised dead like history, dead like she. When the call come again and covered his eyes, this time the blade rise like notes in a scandal on a street corner far, far east past Barica. From a bridge view, the crowd holds notes. One gun, done gun. Lay me down for the band must rest. Yes, music is my occupation. I'm tired of holding this note. You hold this memory for JFK, for me. Make this slide catch is right here so I stop. Bellevue is the view I view. Sometimes I take the whole world mad too. The whole the house of his feet, the brown booger, tall and jar, a door that blow and open and close no more. For the dark suit pressed on the newspaper. Murder, scream the morning paper. 
When he had had really called would hide to slip down sly and cover his eyes. And this time, when he buried her right through, buried it down under the angel trumpet tree. We won. We all did a crow. I played songs to pain. When not a sword come inside my word and tell me it's not true. I love a melancholy baby. Sweet, with fire in our belly. But like a spite, the woman from war. Cool and smooth around the bay, sweet is what's inside me, and I lose my mind. <laughs> Tribe Sankofa, a performing arts collective based in Kingston, Jamaica. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Just look for Tribe Sankofa. Peace, love, blessings. So that was Tribe Sankofa. And we spent time to pay homage to the performing arts because the performing arts and performing artists have been some of the, the best, um, well, the kindest to the language. The language has really expanded its boundaries on the back of the performing arts. And so we spend time um, saying thanks to our performing artists as they point the way forward. So we are coming up to the main purpose for this event, the lecture by Dr. Carla Washington. The choice of Dr. Washington is not, you know, it's not accidental. Um, we didn't choose her um, because we just wanted somebody, but she was specifically chosen because the work that she has been doing uh, falls in line with a big part of the work of the Jamaican Language Unit, and that is helping the public and policymakers to understand the importance of language in national development. And by national development, I'm speaking specifically 
to the role of the language in education and how education shapes um, our nation for development. Because it is foolhardy to believe that we can deal in an effective way with the education of the vast majority of children in the Creolophone Caribbean without considering the mother language of those children. This concern is reflected in the work of scholars over seven or so decades, such as Professor Dennis Craig and Dr. Velma Pollard. Um, the JLU's own bilingual education project coordinated by Professor Hubert Devonish and Dr. Karen Carpenter, and also in the 2017 book entitled What Do Jamaican Children Speak? A Language Resource by Dr. Michelle Kennedy, the immediate past coordinator of the Jamaican Language Unit. So it's out of that concern with the language of our children that we have asked Dr. Washington to just take us through some of the work that she has been doing among Jamaican children. Please note that we will have a question and answer section after Dr. Washington's lecture. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat on YouTube and they will be passed on to me to read out for Dr. Washington to respond to. We're also asking you to ensure that as you stop by to watch and enjoy the lecture, that you ensure that you subscribe to our channel because we have lots of Jamaican language material on the Broadcast Jamaican channel. And we are planning to expand our offering into um, our current affairs program that we're bringing back, Big Things Are Gone, into um, a weekly roundup of the news in Jamaican and various other tutorials um, on the history and the structure of the Jamaican language. So do subscribe to our channel. And as you're watching, please ensure that you share the link with your friends on all social media platforms so that they can come and join in the uh, occasion. So please remember, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat and they will be passed on to me to read out um, for Dr. Washington and she will respond, that is after the lecture. The next person who will speak is Amanda Gooden. In September of this year, Amanda Gooden started the MPhil Linguistics Program in the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy. She's a living testament of the quality of our undergraduate linguistics program. And to her credit, she will formally graduate in January, 2021 as the holder of a Bachelor of Arts in Languages and Linguistics with first class honors. Amanda will now introduce our main speaker, Dr. Carla Washington, after which I will ask Dr. Washington to deliver her lecture without any intervention from me. Amanda. Thank you, Dr. Farkerson. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda, and this evening I have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed presenter, Dr. Carla Washington. Dr. Washington is a speech language pathologist with a license to practice in Jamaica, the United States, and Canada, and a professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Cincinnati in the United States. She is also the lab director of the Pediatric Language, Literacy and Speech Outcomes Lab. The goal of this lab is to engage in collaborative research regarding child language development. A graduate of the University of Western Ontario, Dr. Washington holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology, a Master of Science degree in Communication Sciences and Disorders with a focus on speech language pathology, and a PhD in Rehabilitative Sciences with a focus on speech language pathology. She has previously held positions of lecturer and as a clinical supervisor and educator at the University of Western Ontario in the School of Communication Sciences and Disorders. She has also served as a speech language pathologist at the Toronto Preschool Speech and Language Services and at the H.A. Leeper Speech and Hearing Clinic in London, Ontario. 
She was also a visiting postdoctoral fellow at the Charles Sturt University in Bathurst, Australia. Dr. Washington has published several chapters, articles, and given presentations addressing the typical and disordered language acquisition processes of both monolingual and bilingual children. She has especially researched young children who are bidialectal speakers of Jamaican Creole and English and has been a longtime collaborator with the Jamaican Language Unit. She has received funding in the past from organizations such as the American Speech Language Hearing Association, the University of Cincinnati, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and the United States Health Resources and Services Administration. It is very fitting that Dr. Washington should address us today as the sixth presenter at the annual Cassidy LePage Distinguished Lecture Series. Like the eponyms of our event, Dr. Washington has dedicated a significant portion of her career to researching the Jamaican language situation, its implication on speakers, and in her case, has especially researched children with communication disorders. As linguists or persons with an interest in language, we could all benefit from her extensive research on typical and disordered language acquisition, especially as it applies to our understanding of the language development of children who fall into these categories. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Carla Washington. Thank you very much, Amanda. It is a true honor and pleasure for me to be here today. What I'm going to do right now is to go ahead and to share my screen and deliver my lecture. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent, thank you. So as I said, it is a true honor for me to be here and I'd really like to thank my hosts for inviting me to be here today. It's quite surreal and um, I will hope to live up to the expectation of the person who was just introduced by Amanda. I had to wonder who she was introducing. Uh, as mentioned earlier by Dr. McLaren, I'll be talking about this and that, about Jamaican children's speech and language, distinguishing difference and disorder which is something as a clinician that I work to determine in ways that are very responsive to the cultural and linguistic background of the clients that I see. So many thanks to both the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy, as well as the Jamaican Language Unit. I'd like to give you a brief outline. I'll be talking about the motivations for the project called Jamaican Creole Language Project and also share with you some preliminary findings. Really, I'm gonna talk about two particular studies that used different methodologies and research designs to answer questions about the Jamaican context and end with a uh, practice implications for each of these studies. I'll culminate with a discussion about where do we go from here. I offer my disclosure statement. There are no relevant financial or other conflicts, but I do have funding from the National Institutes of Health and the US Department of Education, as well as endowment funding to the Jamaica Project and funding had supported projects that I am describing today from the university startup funds. I'd like to acknowledge all the people that you see here that made possible this research. I could not have done it without them, the wonderful preschoolers and their families and the staff members and the principals of school officials and my colleagues around the world. I also mention uh, professors Laura and Richard Kretschmer who made possible the work that I'm doing here today and of course my family. So what provided the motivation for this work? I'm going to give you a bit of a story, a narrative about why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's not necessarily linearly related, but you'll get more of a holistic framing of why I came to doing what I am doing. I'll begin by talking about my pivotal experience. And this happened while I was a 
master's student obtaining my degree and I observed my student, my clinician, my clinical supervisor completing an assessment session with a young girl from Jamaica. She came in with her father and she had come in because the teacher had referred her for services due to concerns about how clear she sounded and her word choices as well as her grammar. So we'll call her Sansia and she's four years of age. So the clinician completed these assessments, one of them being one that looks at her uh, morphosyntactic skills, so how she uses sounds in words in terms of the order and the structure of those words. She engaged her in a closed procedure, as you see there, uh, more of a syntactic slot filler approach. So here a boy is sleeping, and then she's setting up the, the syntactic frame, expecting something in the present progressive tense. But in Creole, we're looking more at a continuative aspect tense. And so little Sancia says, Emma go home. And I knew exactly what was happening. I saw the look on my supervisor's face through the one-way mirror, and I knew what she was thinking, but I was thinking something differently. And so she began to tell the father about the concern she had observed, observed for both speech and language. And then she stopped and she said, wait, Carla, get in here. Aren't you Jamaican? Come here, come here, come here. And she allowed me to intervene and I moved over to Sansia because I knew exactly what was happening. And I said, Sansia, I want you to say it in English. Say it like the queen would say it. And she replied, he is driving. I can still remember the look on my supervisor's face. So as I thought about Sansia, I also thought about other immigrants to Canada, like my own family. We came from Jamaica and we went to Canada. I grew up in a home where both English and Jamaican Creole were spoken. My parents were university educated, but my sound system, the grammar, and the vocabulary were different from that of the mainstream use of English used in Canada. I remember classmates saying, you sound different. Teachers saying, you use different words. But overall, they thought it was pretty cool that I was from Jamaica. So I had a very positive experience, in part because I was surrounded by my sisters, and also, my mother was there to help us identify differences between the Creole and the English, which actually gives you a different positioning in terms of your language development. I was there also for Sansia, so that she was not diagnosed with a disorder. Now I think about my little niece, Esther. She is the next generation, and she has been exposed to Jamaican Creole, English, French through school, and also Spanish in the home. So her context is represented by a multilingual experience. So now you start to think, now how common is that? Well, let's think about this. There are at least 8,000 living languages in the world. And this definition that I'm sharing here on the screen has been provided to us by the International Expert Panel on Multilingual Children's Speech. It's broad and it's inclusive because in fact, for someone like me that works with children, it actually reflects the children that I see in my clinics and in the classrooms. What we do know is that the majority of children actually speak more than one language on a daily basis, making multilingualism the norm rather than the exception. In places like the United States, about 20% or 55 million people meet that definition of multilingualism. Important to understand here is that it represents a basic level of functional proficiency, as is italicized on your screen, because it means that not only are they able to comprehend and use two or more languages, but they're able to do so in a way that allows them to be included with other people. This is for someone who might be typically developing. When we go to Europe, we're seeing that the percentage of people who use more than one language on a daily basis could be as high as 75% in places like Northern Europe. Now the linguistic experience of the child or the adult actually is very important for us to understand as a speech language pathologist because, because it provides value in directing our decision-making processes. Now, this notion about understanding multilingualism and the language experience was recently articulated by Professor Anne Charity Hutley during the DuoCon 2020 conference in her share, describe, discover the language and culture of the child, particularly in the educational context. But prior to her sharing, we had written works such as Spoken Soul by John Rickford, and more recently, The Power of the Narrative by Paul Lejano and Shondell Nero. As I refocus our attention to speech language pathology, my chosen profession, 
the, with there being multilingualism, which means, and also multilingualism being actually more the norm rather than the exception, there is in fact a mismatch because only 6.5% of speech language pathologists certified with the American Speech Language Hearing Association meet the set of criteria to be a bilingual service provider. However, we are tasked with providing services that are culturally and linguistically appropriate to all of our clients. So this mismatch does not obviate us from our responsibility of providing appropriate and relevant services. Now, the proportion of speech and language pathologists who actually work with children who are bilingual is actually increasing. However, a re recent work last year by Guyberson and Ferris has shown that specific knowledge to guide decisions about the need for treatment has not kept pace with this growth. Just remember little Sansia, I was there and as a result, she did not she was not diagnosed as having a disorder. So the question becomes, how can we close the gap between the linguistic homogeneity of our profession and the linguistic diversity of its clientele? Well, Confucius said, true wisdom is knowing what we don't know. And we don't know enough about the diversity of the language experience of our clients. Are we beginning to bridge that gap in knowledge? We truly are. How can we do this? We can do this by being more culturally competent. So when my supervisor invited me to come back into the room, she was expressing, she's trying to build her cultural competence because she wanted to adapt her services to meet the cultural needs of little Sansia so that she understood more appropriately with details about Sansia's linguistic profile to inform her decision-making. So cultural competence is an ability to understand, communicate with and effectively interact with people of, across cultures. It requires an assessment of cross-cultural relations and vigilance towards the dynamics of the cultural experiences and differences because cultural experiences are dynamic. They change rapidly. It also requires an expansion of our knowledge, just like what my supervisor did, and then she was able to adapt her services. It requires us also to be culturally, have cultural humility, which means we're more other-oriented and realizing that we're always going to be learning more about cultures and never just have a set attainment. So cultural competence is not a static achievement. It represents a journey, like Aerosmith said. It's a journey, not a destination. So how can we be more and more culturally competent? Perhaps we need to reframe our thinking about health functioning. And the World Health Organization has already taken the leap in leading us in this direction. In fact, in 1946, they defined health as a health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And in this, they have said that communication is a health condition. This is not very hard to conceive in the current milieu when we think about COVID-19. A mitigating factor in the spread of COVID-19 is in fact social distancing. But for some people that has resulted in mental and social well-being being negatively impacted. The World Health Organization has offered us a framework to think more holistically about a person operating in their context and how it impacts their involvement in their life settings. It's called the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, Children and Youth, ICFCY for short. Here, we think about environmental factors such as perhaps Sansia coming from Jamaica where she's exposed to Creole, Jamaican Creole and English. Personal factors, she's, a co she's code mixing and she's using it because that's what she normally does. But for her, the impact on her ability to be included in learning opportunities in the classroom was questioned by her teacher because she referred her for a speech and language assessment thinking there might've been something wrong with her at least her communication. So this is where the notion of difference versus disorder comes about and being able to distinguish between these two. Now, it seems that I'm suggesting that something is dichotomous here, but not necessarily because a disorder can occur in someone who is different. So let's think about what this is defined as. And for us as speech language pathologists, we think about difference as a rule governed style of language that deviates from the standard use of the mainstream culture. I'm from Jamaica, I moved to Canada, and now I'm in Ohio, which is more of the Midwest. I say resources, so I voice that very last hissing sound in the word. However, a lot of the people around me say resources. There's nothing wrong with how I've said it, it's just different. Being from Canada, I say sorry if I'm apologizing, for example, but people in Ohio say sorry. 
another difference. Now we think about disorder, which is a significant discrepancy in speech or language relative to what would be expected for someone when you compare them to someone of a certain age, gender, and developmental level. But the caveat here is that benchmark information used to inform disorder is often furnished by information of speakers who are monolingual native speakers of the ambient language. This is a problem. Let's look at this illustration. So here we have little Esther. The English target here would be two books with a plural marking on the noun. But let's say Esther said two book them, the speech therapist or the teacher, hmm, I don't know what that is. Two book, ah, that's getting closer, but I think she's missing the plural, oh dear. But a linguistic continuum exists because Esther has been exposed to Jamaican Creole, which is reflective of a post Creole society. And I'll get to explaining that in just a bit. We think also about lexical variation. She spent a lot of time with her Nana and her Nana says gleaner rather than newspaper. There is nothing wrong with that. Most British Commonwealth people say gleaner. It's okay. It's not that she doesn't know what a newspaper is, but someone who doesn't realize that gleaner is newspaper might misunderstand that information. Now making the appropriate determination about a child who speaks two or more languages and is typically developing from a child who is truly disordered can be challenging. This is because what constitutes a grammatical structure that marks a disorder in one language might actually be a well-formed feature of another. Now, there is no expectation that a speech and language pathologist is supposed to know all of those 8,000 languages or to know every single language spoken by their client, but we need to find a way to bridge that gap through our cultural competence and continually building of our knowledge. And with cultural competence being an ever-growing experience, we're gonna be ever-growing learners. If we think about the example of this phenomenon of the, the use of copula, so, a sentence isn't considered to be well-formed in standard English if it doesn't have a verb. So for example, if you heard someone say she happy, you might consider that in standard English to be agrammatical. However, sentences such as she happy are not markers of agrammatism in certain dialectal communities such as African-American and also for certain language communities such as Latin, Russian, Arabic, and Hebrew. So the concern about misdiagnosis is actually very real. There is no evidence that being multilingual means that you have higher or lower rates of having a speech disorder. And there's no correlation between multilingualism and disorder. However, there is the risk of children being underdiagnosed, which means someone who actually is different in their communication, not being thought of being possible of being disordered, but that puts the child at risk for academic and career underachievement. But overdiagnosis also occurs. So a child who's typically developing but uses more than one language could be diagnosed with a disorder and that puts the child at risk for social stigma. Now, it also comes with a hefty price tag to the educational system and occurs at a rate of about 9%. Much of what we know about multilingual development or dual language development comes from more commonly studied language pairings such as Spanish and English, French and English, and the numbers of people justify that focus. However, when we think about more understudied language pairings such as a Creole language and its lexifier, which is representative of people from Jamaica or people from Haiti, which you have Haitian, Creole and French, or Spanish and Catalan. So we need to understand language pairings and the typological relationship that have shared linguistic foundations. So here I have focused on the Jamaican context, not just because I'm Jamaican or because it's such a wonderful country, but because it's worthy of our focus. So Jamaican society is diglossic. So in linguistics, diglossia is a situation which occurs when two languages or dialects are used by a single language community. And in the Jamaican community, we have Jamaican Creole, and we have English in existence. Now, in this diglossic society, there's variation that occurs along a post-Creole continuum with one language being given high status, which usually is the language of the prestige and the slave owner, and in this case, it's English, and then another low status, which is the Creole in the case in Jamaican Creole society. Let's think about this. So Jamaican Creole is an oral language and is typically used in situations that are perceived to be more informal with family or friends, but it is considered to be the language of the people 
and in Cassidy's work, which has not been challenged to date, to be considered somewhat of the first language of most Jamaicans. Only recently has a standardized orthography been introduced by the Jamaican language unit in 2002, but it's not, sorry, 2000, about 2002, we don't, uh, it's not something that is taught in schools. So it's still passed on from generation to generation orally. And it is a language that extended from contact between West African languages and English due to slavery, but does stand apart. It stands independent of both of its heritage languages. Now we think about English. This is in contrast because it has a strong oral and written foundation and it is used formally for both education, commerce, and business. Growth in this popula, so we have many more, I've heard it said, many more Jamaicans outside Jamaica than in Jamaica. And with them, with their culture, they bring their language. So if you remember my clinical supervisor, little Sansa in the clinic, she had a young Jamaican Creole English speaking child on her caseload and was being asked to make a decision. With the growth in this linguistic populace, even more clinicians are going to be asked to make this decision. But we need more information than to equip speech language pathologists to make competent decisions about the children's language performance. And also more information to know about the communicative experiences of these children so that there can be guidance for both diagnostic and treatment purposes. And Charity Hudley also talked about certain key considerations we need to understand that Creole languages exist and they're not broken languages. We need to understand what the language pairing looks like between the Creole language and its lexifier, what it looks and what it sounds like, and how, what is the experience of people who represent that language pairing. What I want to illustrate for you here with this video is to show you that the, child, the person on the left here is uh, Nigerian, the person on the right is Jamaican Creole, so West African and Jamaican Creole, so one of the parent languages, but you will see that there are differences, and I, I show you this illustration to show that the Creole language can be and is independent of its heritage language. Forest, forest, botu, baku, pomegranate, panganate, macaroni, macaroni, Vitamins, vitamin, padu, pago, uh -uh. military, military, oil, aisle. Then how do you say aisle? Aisle. Plantain. Plantain. <laughs> Coconut. Coconut. <laughs> Neighbor. Neighbor. <laughs> Tomato. <laughs> so these friends are having a good time together, but you see the illustration, they sounded different. The way in which they said the same word was quite distinct. So the notion of having an understanding of this linguistic diversity between a parent language and its lexifier and its, and its Creole language is something that is important. And in fact, we need the linguistic power to inform change in practice. Children have the right to use their language because it's part of their culture and it preserves both meaning and value. From a professional standpoint, it's also reflective of our cultural competence and is part of the resolution passed by the Conference on College Composition and Communication, the National Council of Teaching English. So understanding the language use requires that then we have an understanding of its structures for the sound system, the grammar system, the, lexi the lexifiers, and also the narrative or the storytelling. And these are sentiments echoed by linguists and human rights activists from Martin Luther King to Nelson Mandela, John Rickford, Shondell Nero, and Hubert Devonish. So where does this take us to now? This takes us to the Jamaican Creole Language Project. This was birthed out of a need to engage in practice-based evidence so that I could understand and fill this gap in knowledge because I did not want another Sansia experience happening. So I'm going to share with you preliminary findings from two projects that occurred in the last few years. One of them looking at measuring functional speech intelligibility that adhere to more of the traditional scientific method, quantitative methodologies and analyses, and the other that use more descriptive approach applying somewhat of a qualitative approach to understanding how children can become experts in informing us about their own development by way of their drawings. 
So we're going to talk about measuring functional speech intelligibility in the Jamaican context. And this is our, this, what I'm talking about today is part of published works in clinical linguistics and phonetics and the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology. I share my disclosure statement here and acknowledge my colleagues, Megan Katz, Sharon McLeod, Hubert Devenish, and Catherine Crow. Producing speech that is intelligible and understood by different communication partners is in fact a critical part of full participation in society. Why is this important? For speech and language pathologists, in fact, a survey study completed by Sharon McLeod in, 20, in 2004 asked speech pathologists this question. How do you decide that a child's speech is not developing normally? What is the triggering factor? Intelligibility was the most common response, defined as the degree to which the listener understands what the speaker says when the target is uncertain. So there is a speaker and a listener requiring a two-way interaction and is in influenced by factors unique to the speaker and unique to the listener. Now, it's not only about sounds are correct in words or that you are clear, but how do you use those that capacity to be then included with others? So we look here at functional speech intelligibility, which refers to when we're thinking about children, their ability to produce sounds in words that enhance their participation with listeners of varying familiarity and authority. How are we gonna do this for others if we're not certain how they're communicating well? So the intelligibility in context scale is actually a validated tool for assessing functional speech across different interlocutors. And it's meant for screening speech sound disorders. It has in fact been translated into more than 60 different languages. It's a seven item parent report measure that uses a five point scale from always to never. So a parent is going to rate their child and they're gonna think about their child in the last month and say, how well was your child understood by all of these different listeners? It actually is reflective of the World Health Organization's ICFCY framework because it considers contextual factors. These are the contextual factors, the different listeners, they are the environment. Who are the different listeners in the child's environment? Now, as I mentioned, it was translated into 60 different languages. One of these languages is Jamaican Creole. And this translation occurred in 2014 with the help of my colleague, Professor Hubert Devenish. Back translation was completed in cooperation with the ICS developers, Professor Sharon McLeod and her team. Now, one thing I'm going to tell you here is that we actually provided an audio recording of, Jamaica, of the Jamaican Creole version. You might be thinking about why did that happen? That happened because Remember, Jamaican Creole is an oral language, and to ensure that there were no confounds in the completion of this measure, we wanted to ensure that we leveled the playing field, and so parents listened to audio recordings of both the Creole and the English. So I'll give you a small sampling. Measure for how much other people can understand the picnic, Jamaican. Intelligibility in context scale, Jamaican Creole. The English and the Creole version are identical in their structure, content, and scoring scale. And they're both presented using audio recordings. So here's what it looks like for Jamaican Creole, the seven interlocutors across the five-point rating scale, every time to never. So the purpose of our study was to conduct the first validation effort of the intelligibility and context scale in the Jamaican populace for the developing child that's about three to six years of age for us to evaluate this notion of functional intelligibility. We also wanted to provide psychometric evidence about its use in a sample of children who did not have speech sound disorder. If you remember, that's the first development that was a purpose of the development of that tool. But by working with kids who are typically developing, we were increasing the range of applicability of this measure. We enrolled 145 preschoolers who were speakers of the Creole and the English from three public schools recommended to us by the Early Childhood Commission and the children range in age from three to six years of age. Parents completed the intelligible and context scale in both English and in Jamaican Creole and listened to recordings via laptops presented using audio recordings and then they use paper and pencil format to respond. 
we completed counterbalance sessions and parents didn't know what they said for the one language when completing for the other language. We then engaged in some reliability measures where we had the same parent complete the measure about a week later. And then we had two parents completing the same measure for the same child at the same time. Now, the intelligibility and context skill provides us proxy level information about how intelligible, how understood a child is to different speakers. We also need a confirmatory or more objective evidence about the child's speech production, looking more at how accurately they said individual sounds in words. And so we engaged in counterbalance language specific sessions with language specific clinicians, for example, myself for Creole or my colleagues. Professor Sharon McLeod completing it in English. And then we would analyze the sounds as the child had produced them in these single words that were elicited in picture naming tasks. Professor Hubert Devanish facilitated this process for us because we wanted to measure that accuracy using well-known clinical measures for phoneme production, consonants correct, vowels correct, phonemes correct. But this notion of correct had to be informed by the Jamaican context. And so Professor Hubert Devanish ensured that the inventory of adult-like productions were reflected in the task that we were completing. For example, if you look at the bottom row, thumb could be produced as thumb, tom, or big finger. Yes, big finger, very known in the Jamaican context, representing these polar varieties. So now we want to move on to our analytical part of our study where we're going to analyze the measure and the data that we gathered for reliability, looking at internal consistency, accuracy and consistency of the findings and how well the structure of intelligibility held up. So what did we find? Our first question addressed whether or not the, what were the mean scores like in the Jamaican context for both of these measures. We found that children were similarly understood in both of their spoken languages. And in fact, they were most understood by parents and least understood by strangers. These are typically developing children. This is a pattern that we expect even for children who are not typically developing. And this pattern actually held true for other studies completing uh, research with intelligibility and context scale. We move along to reliability. So when we want to establish the internal consistency so or how items hold together on a measure, it's very critical to ensure its clinical utility. And what did we find? We had excellent evidence of internal consistency. And for reliability for the same parent across two time points or between two parents, we found very high inter and intra-rater reliability. That is outstanding. This is good. We're moving on to validity. So we wanted to ask the question of how well the items on the intelligibility and context scale correlated with scores that we got from children, the more objective data coming directly from the source. We also wanted to find out how well those intelligibility and context scale measures held up to gold standards, such as those measures of production accuracy for phonemes correct, consonants correct, and vowels correct. Well, we had, very, we had good evidence for construct validity and also for criterion validity evidence. I highlighted here for you these mean scores because we found that Jamaican children actually had very high levels of phoneme accuracy, but they tended to be quite variable. That's no surprise for someone who studies for a linguist to hear that you know someone in a post creole continuum world is variable. But for a clinician, I'm thinking that's an indicator, that's what I've been taught, of a disorder called apraxia of speech. But these kids were not disordered, but they're birthed my National Institutes of Health funded research with my colleague at NYU. Next, we asked the question about how were the scores in the Jamaican context related between English and Creole? Well, we found positive correlations in terms of parents' ratings of different communication partners and actual mean scores for both Creole and English for when the children were tested. We also found that the scores did not differ between Creole and English, showing us that the measure is robust. We took it to the next level in our recent publication to answer the question of how well does this measure actually separate children who are disordered and separate children who are typical. So we're talking about sensitivity, truly identifying that the child is typical and sensitivity, so, and specificity, 
sorry, no. Sensitivity is showing that it's a true positive rate and specificity showing that it's a true negative rate. So they're not disordered when you say they're not disordered and they're typical when you say they're typical. And we found evidence for both of these measures. This is good. What does this tell us? These combined levels of evidence tell us that the intelligibility in context scale has value in the Jamaican context. And parents should in fact be encouraged to complete both of these measures because we're looking at two different linguistic systems. Our recommendation is that speech pathologists encourage parents to use both of these measures. And when we use an auditory administration of this tool, it does not negatively impact the psychometric evidence obtained. And in fact, might be relevant for languages with a new or absent written forms. So I'm going to change gears briefly here to move into a different type of research project where we use more of a descriptive or a qualitative approach, where we use drawings to understand Jamaican children's talking experiences. I acknowledge Corinne Jutenberg, Rachel wright Karam, Cecilia Schwartz, Kylie Lobick, and Professor Sharon McLeod, my colleagues in this effort. And the research being described here is actually part two of a three-part research study, but this particular study looked at children's drawings in both of their spoken languages. This study actually also won an award from the American Speech Language Hearing Association to, share, to, to Corinne Dutenberg for the highest rated student abstract in this category. Now there's evidence to show that children's drawings offer an unbiased approach to understanding their everyday experiences. It's also ecologically valid. What do I mean? I mean, children are naturally engaging in using drawings just as part of perhaps having fun or activity in class. And so we can use ways that children are naturally engaging in to learn about their communication. We can also engage children as experts in this way because they're leading the effort in the drawing. And by doing this, we're providing children a voice in matters that concern them. Now, growing awareness of the rights of the child has resulted in children being engaged as experts in their own lives. And this is part of the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child in Article 12, where we are encouraged to place as few restrictions on, restrictions on children as possible in including them in matters that concern them. So we need to have the viewpoint that the child is capable of forming his or her own views. It's the right of the child to be heard. Now, including children's voices in matters that involve their interests is an important premise in modern society. And in fact, using drawings makes children active participants in matters that concern them and in turn adheres to Article 12 of the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. So what was our purpose? We sought to characterize bio Jamaican children's, J Jamaican Creole and English speaking preschoolers talking experiences by way of their drawings by first examining themes such as talking or listening or who they were talking to and focal points such as maybe colors used or facial expressions in their drawings. We also sought to examine ch Jamaican children's ratings to inform their perceptions about their thoughts and experiences about talking. 23 children participated in this study and they range from four to six or about equal numbers of males and females and they were characterized as typically developing and they were from a school in Kingston, Jamaica. So what did we do? We engaged children in responding to prompts in Jamaican Creole or in English with language specific clinicians in counterbalance sessions to draw themselves talking to someone in each of the languages. So in English, the child would hear, I want you to draw a picture for me. Is it okay if I keep it when you're done? Draw a picture of you talking to someone. And then you hand a blank piece of paper to the child with some multicolored felted markers, and then they would go ahead and draw. The instruction in Creole would be, I want you to draw one picture for me. Make can keep it when you're done. Draw yourself a talk to somebody else. And then time for about five to seven minutes, the child would draw. And as you can see on the top row here, this is what the child drew when responding to the Jamaican Creole prompt. And on the bottom here, this is what the child, a five-year-old female drew in response to the English prompt. Then children responded to questions about their drawing. You probably are not seeing this very clearly. So I will tell you, the child was asked, who's in the drawing? Me and my friend. How do you know them? They're my friend. 
Do you like this person? Yes, I do. And where are you? We're at the playground. What are you doing? We're talking. What are you talking about? We're talking about flowers. Are you happy about the way you talk? Yes, I very much am. Then we engage children in another task using the speech participation and activity assessment of children, which allowed us to find out more information about the talking experiences in context of Jamaican children. This measure is designed to elicit information primarily from children who are having speech difficulties, but people are encouraged to use these questions to increase their understanding of individual children and the context in which they live. It is also framed around that World Health Organization International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, where we consider those environmental factors because we're asking children how they feel about talking to different types of people in different types of situations. So for example, how do you feel when you talk to your brother? Or you feel when you talk to your brother? In English, this child did not feel very happy. They felt sad. But when they spoke in Creole, they felt happy. So they're thinking differently about how they feel with different people using each of their languages. Now it came time to analyzing the information. The meaning making approach is a process by which the message conveyed in the child's drawing is abstracted and then allows us to understand children's social understandings and interpretations of the world. So we applied a meaning making approach to the drawings for three themes that were previously identified in a study by Holiday, Harrison and McLeod to capture expressions feelings and experiences about talking. We also considered the focal points approach, which allowed us to consider the closeness, the vitality, the positive positivity, and also to capture hidden meanings based on relationships depicted. And we found seven, there were seven previously identified focal points by the same researchers. So trained speech language pathology students independently analyzed and coded each of the drawings based on the three themes and the seven focal points. And we also then engage in interreliability evidence. The speech participation activity assessment was then also coded for analyzing those drawings just by counting how many people were happy in response to number one, number two, number three for each of the questions. What did we find? Well, we found for the themes that in Jamaican Creole, theme one, talking or listening, and theme three, being happy, were the most frequently coded. In English, it was family and friends were involved in the drawings. And we had high evidence of reliability between raters as evidenced by the near perfect agreement. Just a reminder, we had smiles on the faces both in the Creole drawing and in the English drawing. And there were people in the drawing with the children. Moving on to the focal points, what did we find here? So what was our attention drawn to? In both Creole and English, we found that conversational partners was what was the most frequently coded, followed by facial expressions where the children were primarily depicting happy faces for both Creole and English with once again, high evidence of interrelator reliability. Moving on to looking at the data from the speech participation activity assessment. We found that based on the responses the children said, the majority of children across all these questions were mostly feeling happy about the way they spoke in Jamaican Creole. And we found a similar pattern for English. So these children are actually feeling quite happy. What is our conclusion here? Drawings and questions from the speech participation activity assessment were useful tools for us to understand communicative experiences of typically developing children who use two languages on a daily basis. We learned that Jamaican preschoolers were generally happy about the way they spoke in each of their languages. And so clinically, was the, what does this mean? It means that the views and culture of linguistically diverse preschoolers can be expressed and abstracted to monolingual speech language pathologist, because drawings offer us an alternate yet ecologically valid way of understanding the development of children who use more than one language on a daily basis. And by using these alternate ways, we bridge that gap in our knowledge and we improve our cultural competence. So where do we go from here? Shondell Nero in her language identity and insider outsider positionality in Caribbean Creole in published in Applied Linguistics talked about this notion of research on identity and positioning. 
after I personally engaged in these experiences, I learned so much about myself, my culture, these little children running around. I thought, oh, that's little me. That's why I do that. It's because it's my Jamaican background. I had a top-down perspective and I learned so much and had so much more appreciation of my upbringing. What we need now is a call to action for cl clinicians and educators as well as researchers. We engaged in research with Jamaican Creole and English speaking preschoolers to understand the language experiences of children who speak languages with shared linguistic foundations. This is different from someone who might speak Spanish and English, but not so different from someone who speaks Catalan and Spanish. So we might provide a model system for informing approaches to working with other children who have languages with shared linguistic foundations. For clinicians and educators, we need to measure, use measures and techniques appropriate to the child's context, consider all of the child's languages, include the children in their voices in our research. And it's not necessarily, we're not saying it's easy, but there are ways that we can do this. Also offer experiential learning opportunities to students. So take them outside their comfort zone. You're not saying you have to travel abroad to do it, but within your community, there is cultural and linguistic diversity within your own communities. For researchers collecting data in all of the child's languages and also broadening our current theoretical understandings about language paradigms to inform multilingualism and dual language development and not have more of a narrow focus on that topic include qualitative and quantitative methodologies and including parents perspective as well as children's voices. To support you in this endeavor, there are resources. There's the Jamaican language unit, the multilingual children's speech website, and also the international expert panel on multilingual children's speech, which has provided a tutorial about speech assessments for multilingual children who do not speak the same language as a speech and language pathologist. And there's other information you can abstract from this type of research. So I'd like to say thank you to my hosts and I will now turn things over. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Washington. A lot of food for thought. Um, you know, even before I go into my thoughts, I'll just read two of the, um, the comments on the going on in the YouTube chat. So Fabian say, say um, interestingly and sadly, we have the same gaps in proper assessment in terms of understanding and respect here in Jamaica. And, and I apologize. I think John is, is correcting me where, where, where I said that uh, the type of work you're doing is important for Creolophone societies. Um, John Walker is saying this study is so important to all children worldwide. Um, and she's right about that. So um, while people get their questions together or comments, I just wanted to ask, now you had your, your initial trigger for moving in this direction. I think to some extent is understand is understandable. People would say, well, the child was not in their original community, so you would expect misdiagnosis. Um, but what about in Jamaica and the work you have been doing in Jamaica? Can you say anything? Um, whether by just your observations or from actual empirical research, what is the likelihood of a child being, uh, meaning uh, uh, a regularly functioning child misdiagnosed in Jamaica because of language that he or she speaks? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I do believe that I mean, it's, it's possible. You know, they say anything is possible. And so I believe with the lack of education about the language, is the primary fuel for what would lead to that misdiagnosis. I will say that there's much more known now about Jamaican Creole and it's embracing its use than when I was growing up in Jamaica. And so I feel that we're moving in the direction where we're moving away or decreasing the likelihood of that occurring 
Now, trying to give a percentage within the Jamaican context is harder for me to estimate, in part because the practice of speech pathology is more limited, and I come from it from more a speech and language perspective. More internationally, if you look in North America, the representation of children who are culturally and linguistically diverse in, in special education is quite high. It could be as much as 50% in some urban settings. Why? Because sometimes their language profile is it's different and we don't know enough to say that it isn't disordered. And so my work and the work of others is meant to bridge that gap. And speech pathologists, we do really care. So I don't want to give the impression that speech pathologists are just going around misdiagnosing. That is actually the antithesis of what we want to do. We want to be able to support children in their development and to equip us, we try to learn more about the languages and experiences of children who are dissimilar to us linguistically and culturally. Okay, thank you. Um, so I know um, as linguists, we, we own um, speech language pathologists as the you know, kindred spirits. Um, that you're in the more applied side of linguistics. And when we speak to potential students about what they can do with linguistics, um, speech language pathology is one of those areas. Of course, you need additional training, but linguistics is generally a very good base to start from. Now, um, I brought up applied um, because you're a practitioner and you interface regularly with teachers, yeah, who are the ones at the forefront um, with the children, and they are the first call in making some sort of observation and initial analysis of the, ch of the child's or the children's behavior. Uh, Winsome Wellington, who is an English teacher, I gather from her question, some school administrators refuse to accept the fact that the Creole language should be used in classrooms in English classes. How can we get around this as teachers of English? So when, when she says use, is it used by the child or used by the teacher? I think she's saying um, used by the, the, the teacher, but both, both too, both, well, both child and teacher. Okay, if she wants to punt, I mean, she can cite uh, human rights. I mean, it's the child's right to be able to embrace his or her linguistic culture. Now, I understand the distinction between encouraging a child to use the home language versus the school language, but we can find a way to bridge that gap within the classroom by using educational moments by talking about language and culture around the world. So within her language class, she can refocus how she's giving those lessons to have that seep in and in, in fact to help the school administrator know this is about language policy and language rights to have a child be encouraged to embrace their language because in fact as you mentioned when you started that language and culture are very intertwined you can't have one without the other it's like you can't pull them apart and so i hope that offers some some sort of clarity to um is it Winsome was her name? Winsome Wellington. Winsome Wellington. Joseph. Yes. Um, Joseph. Yes. yes. A, a, related, a related question to the one that um, uh, Professor Washington just answered. Um, and I had actually written it down as um, she gave her lecture. Um, uh, Professor Washington, I mean, uh, listening to you, quite an interesting quite an interesting lecture, um, uh, and I knew it was going to be uh, touching on all the various aspects that you've done. Um, given the relationship that you had highlighted between uh, the Jamaican Creole and English, does encouraging the use of Jamaican, either by government or by a university, or by a school administration at whatever level, affect a child's ability, or in fact, an adult, an adult's ability to learn, to speak, and to write the English language effectively well. Does it? 
That's a great question. Um, and I know it's something that was recently articulated in this move to um, make Jamaican Creole official. The, the, I, I was part of that um, recent uh, exchange. And it, it, this, this one requires a delicate answer because here we have the language of the people and people are suggesting that, well, we need to be careful about how we encourage the use of the language of the people. However, I'll, in my example, for me personally growing up, I had a model system so that I would know what was English and what was the Creole. So I feel that if we're using the parameters of not wanting to encourage the, the use of the Creole because you think of it has a negative effect on the development of English, then perhaps providing education about what is the English and what is the Creole is one of the ways that we can move forward in supporting language and culture, that intersection of the two. Because if you try to suppress the language of the people, it might only result in people wanting to use that Creole language more and avoid the language that we are using for business and commerce and internationalization. So I think educating the public, which is one of the, um, which falls under the auspices of the Jamaican language unit, more about what is the Creole and what is the English can help to bridge that gap and in fact support achievement for both adults and for children. That's how I was able to distinguish between the two because I had someone educating me. Okay, I wanted to, uh, to bring in another point and this um, is- just, just a quick observation. I'm glad that um, Prof asked the question and I totally concur with um, Carla's and, um, response because we, we do find not attempts to teach writing. I, you know, I, I don't like to say we're teaching English, teach writing, that a lot of times students have difficulty differentiating between both the Creole and the English. Um, in their speech in particular, they, they are not aware you know, of these differences. And they sometimes they think they're speaking English when in fact, it's a mixture of English and Creole. So I, I think more education in this area would be very, very helpful. Thank you. If I may just um, extend my response, it's not unique only to the notion of Creole and English, that dichotomous. If we think about um, just native speakers of English, and we think about some university level students and this notion of text talking, right? So they're having so much practice in using texting, especially now in this milieu where we're not having this interpersonal interaction face to face, how is that impacting on their written text for say report writing or composition writing? Sometimes you see the bleed over of this text talking and you have to remind them that's actually not proper English, that's text talk. And so this notion is not only something that's experienced by speakers of a Creole and, and English, but also speakers of native English or other native languages around the world. Great, great. And um, following up on that point, Charles Ball, who is writing from Australia, um, wants to ask how different would the application of these findings be within the diglossic Jamaican society versus outside where there is less awareness of the language background of bilingual Jamaican children. So I'm hoping I understood his question uh, properly. So uh, the application of the findings in terms of, for, for example, the usage of the tools and the, the techniques that um, we have suggested, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully I'm, I'm understanding the question. Um, I, I don't think it limits it because one of the unique aspects about speakers of Jamaican Creole and English is that they primarily come from Jamaica, unlike other places. So a Spanish English speaker can come from Cuba, somewhere in South America or in Europe, Dominican Republic, but most speakers of Jamaican Creole and English majority are coming from Jamaica. And so if we're going to then look at using these tools within Jamaica itself to help us formulate more information about speakers in their native settings, we can then buttress that information in more internationalized contexts where Jamaicans live. And we have more Jamaicans residing outside Jamaica than inside Jamaica. And so I think it actually has utility in both settings. Okay, thanks. Uh, so 
something that is very common, and this has um, been going on probably for well over a century, is what I call the pathologization of, uh, of the Jamaican language, where it is treated uh, like a disease that you need to get rid of. Now, I know you're a speech language pathologist. Um, I'm asking you to be a psycholinguist um, now. But to what extent do you think, or did you find any evidence in your field research that this has a bearing on students' performance in school? The fact that their language, their, their mother language is pathologized and is thought to be something that you have to, you have to um, surgically remove. Does that affect how students interact in the classroom and how they perform? So I just want to make sure I've understood the pathologizing of the Creole, having more of a negative viewpoint of the Creole, does that impact their language use of the classroom language? Is that the, or, or the English? Generally, generally. Just, oh, just generally? Well, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I was quite impressed with, and, and I've been doing this research since uh, about 2013 with different groups of children. And these Jamaican kids that, and now I did go to schools recommended to me by the Early Childhood Commission as being representative of the Jamaican child using the Creole and the English. And in those types of settings, I have found that children understand the Creole and the English in ways that, oh, when I use the Creole, this is going to be what I say do on the playground. And when I'm going into the classroom, I use this kind of language. I use more the language of the classroom. And I also see that their teachers are there to help model. So I think this is not just about the, the child, him or herself. We need the help of the educators, the teachers, the parents, the speech pathologists, the people outside the child's school. It takes a village, they say. And so I believe that in order to reduce any negative effects, we ourselves, and it goes back to this notion of education about the language, because it's something that's part of the culture. Thank and you. I feel the dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Uh, go ahead, Carla. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, to, to, to feel that you need to surgically remove one part from the other, um, I think that, that that might be somewhat risky and have more of a detrimental effect. Again, having the education about what is the Creole and what is the English is, I think, at the heart helping these two languages peacefully coexist. Joseph, Joseph, yes. it, it, it's interesting how you framed that question by saying patholized, patholized, Yes. You immediately presupposed a disease condition. And immediately, as a historian, the question poses itself. Under what kinds of social conditions were we made to think that the indigenous language has now constituted a disease which, if not surgically expunged, could affect our social being and our ability to communicate in the language that is disease free, which is the language of the invader. Now, all of this relates to the point I was making at the onset about identity and how by suppression of the indigenous language, we have come to think of ourselves as diseased. So we have been recreated in the image of another language in ways that affect our well being, in ways that allows us to think that 
if something is not removed from us, and that which has to be removed from us is wrong for our social well being linguistically. So that we as academics in teaching the use of uh, the Jamaican Creole side by side with English must not forget the historical circumstances that led to the situation we are discussing that in fact gave rise to the scholarship that we are discussing. So when we say that the condition is diseased, the situation is, is a disease uh, situation, we must immediately ask the question, how did we get here? If we did not have the second language, we ourselves talking to ourselves now will not frame the question in the way we have framed it. So the historical situation cannot be divorced from the clinical aspects or the, the, the sociolinguistic aspects that we are discussing. Thanks very much, um, Professor Wariboko. So I believe that um, this has been very useful, very informative. And all that remains now is for us to abide by the adage that all good things must come to an end. However, we cannot end without thanking those people who have helped to make this event a success. Our vote of thanks will be done by Mrs. Susanna Campbell Blaygrove, Senior Administrative Assistant in the Jamaican Language Unit. Mrs. Campbell Blaygrove holds a BA in Theology and Psychology from UIMONA and is pursuing a postgraduate diploma in linguistics. And she has also um, assisted Dr. Washington as uh, an assistant in the field. So Susanna, I now invite you to give the vote of thanks. Susanna Thank might appear um, with her camera off because she's having internet trouble. Thank you, Dr. Farkison. Uh, any other time, this would have been an audacious undertaking by the Jamaican Language Unit, having an event on a Friday evening. But these are special times and here we all are. So now we stop to say thank you. Thank you to the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Professor Wariboko for his steady and courageous leadership and constant support to the Jamaican Language Unit, as well as the support from the faculty office itself. Thank you to the, D, to the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy and to our head, Dr. Ingrid McLaren, for her continued support as well. Thank you to Tribe Sankofa for sharing so freely their art and heart. It was an invigorating and refreshing piece of entertainment. I shamelessly say here that I'm a member of that group and tonight I am especially proud. Special thanks to the team at the Jamaican Language Unit, Miss Kadeen Marshall, who was in the comment section tonight interacting with you. Also to our usual page operators, Miss Tally Thorny and Mr. Oren Ennis. Thank you also to this evening's moderator, who also doubles as the coordinator for the Jamaican Language Unit, Dr. Joseph Ferguson. A special, special thank you to Dr. Washington, for so readily agreeing to be the speaker for this event. I've been working with her for a very long time, I think since the beginning of her project here, and it has been a pleasure working with her from then until now. Thank you, Dr. Washington, for enlightening us on our own language use and the variations of language in general. Also, thank you for the work you are doing for the Jamaican language unit, I mean, for the Jamaican language and for its speakers, at home and abroad. You are here at home among advocates. Thank you to our virtual audience. Though you are, have been virtual, you, your presence has made this event a success. Big up on yourself. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right. Thank you, Susanna. And uh, you, Susanna. Just, just remember that um, 
more is coming on our YouTube channel, Broadcast Ramekan. As I pointed out before, we are restarting our Big Things Aguan uh, program, which is a current affairs program in the Jamaican language. Our main presenter there is Professor Emerita Carolyn Cooper. So watch out for our announcements about that. Also, we will be doing a, a weekly roundup of news in the Jamaican language, 